Well, hello everyone. Bill here from The Attentive Traveler. Welcome to episode number one, Arrival into Italy and to into Milan. In today's episode, I'm going to talk briefly about connecting the dots. Our choices on arrival into Milan, as well as from getting from the airport into our hotel. And then we're going to dive into how we decided what we wanted to see, we were going to, where we were going to lay our heads at night, and what we were going to eat. We'll also discuss tours and whether we chose any guides. Milan is Italy's city of the future, a fast-paced metropolis with new world qualities, ambition, aspiration, and a highly individualistic streak. In Milan, appearances really do matter, and materialism requires no apology. The Milanese love beautiful things, luxurious things. And it is for that reason, perhaps, that Italian fashion and design maintain their esteemed global position. But like the models that work the catwalks, Milan is considered by many to be vain and distant and dull. However, this superficial lack of charm disguises a city of ancient roots and many treasures, which unlike the rest of Italy, you'll often get to experience without the cues. So while the Malinese may not always play nice, jump in and join them regardless of their intoxicating round of pursuits. Whether that means precision shopping, browsing edgy contemporary galleries, or loading up a plate with local delicacies while downing an expertly mixed Negroni. Now, following Rick Steve's advice, we will arrive into Milan by plane. Now, we've traveled overseas using Delta Airlines for a just over eight hour flight into Amsterdam. And then our flight leaves in the evening from the United States and it places us into Amsterdam a little afternoon, Amsterdam time. And I'm sure you're wondering about the time difference. It is seven hours different in Milan from the central time zone where I am found in the United States. Now after clearing immigration and passport control in Amsterdam, we plan to hop onto a flight at 5 p.m. that places us on the ground in Milan at 6.40. Now we're going to be flying Delta, and we're going to be utilizing the Delta One system while on the long overseas flight. Now in some past trips, the ability to get a decent sleep on the plane has helped immensely when getting tuned to a new time zone. And lying flat is such a big deal, especially for a guy like me who is not built for the smaller normal seats. So let's connect some dots. How do we actually get from the airport to our hotel? Now the Malpensa airport is about 30 miles outside of downtown Milan. So any way you take the journey, it's likely going to take you about 45 minutes to get from the airport into the city. Now the least expensive way of doing that is to take one of the three bus companies that run a shuttle bus between the airport and the Milano Centrale train station. They all charge about eight euros, that's per person, for the one hour trip, and you buy your ticket actually from the driver. Uh, you can also take the Malpensa Express train. It leaves from underground stations at terminals one and two. Uh, most international flights arrive into terminal two, so then you'll need to exit the arrival hall, cross the street, and follow a covered walkway to the station entrance. You buy your tickets here or there, and then the ride costs you about 13 euros currently per person, and it also takes about 40 to 45 minutes. Now in both of those examples, I can envision my dear wife and myself lugging three bags at least of luggage across the road and out to the shuttle bus to be picked up. You should know that about my wife and I. Compared to most, we travel with a bit more luggage than many. Uh, I, I know it would be easy for me to blame my wife and her two pieces of luggage, but I travel reasonably heavy as well. 
So we looked at some other options. Now, we could take a taxi. A taxi for about 95 euros for a one-way ride. And you'd still have to get and lug everything out to the taxi stand. So this is my wife's first experience in a foreign country that does not speak English. And so I have chosen to hire another private driver uh, who will meet us as soon as we exit customs. And it's a bit pricey. It's about 240 euros. But for my wife and I, I think it's worth the comfort. Now for shorter trips between towns, I'm gonna to often look at private drivers, but we expect to use the train quite a bit as well. Now since we arrive around 7 p.m. Milano time, we're gonna take it easy this first night. We have no plans to go anywhere except maybe a light dinner. The fun is really gonna start the next morning. Now on the chart you see on this slide, I've listed all the three star, the two star, and the one star activities, along with some other interesting options. The choices that are in green are the sites that we've decided to experience during our one full day in Milan. Now according to St. Rick Steves, there's only one three star activity, a visit to the Duomo Cathedral. A vision in pink, Candoglia marble, this cathedral embodies Milan's verve and its ambition. Began by Gia Gialazio Visconti in 1387. By the way, I'm sure I screwed up that name. Its design was originally considered unfeasible. Canals were dug to transport the vast quantities of marble to the city center, and new technologies were invented to cater for the never before attempted scale. And now it's pearly white facade and it's extravagant details. It's really the city's crown attraction. I visited the official site, www.duomomilanoit, and I actually made ticketed reservations to visit at 10 a.m. Now, before entering the church, we'll probably catch coffee or some tea and take in the morning energy from the Piazza del Duomo. The piazza is dominated by the massive prickly facade of the Duomo. The huge equestrian statue in the center of the piazza is Victor Emmanuel II, who was the first king of Italy. He's looking at the grand gallery and named for him. And the words above the triumphal entrance read to Victor Emmanuel II from the people of Milan. This grand square is ground zero for public events and marches and spectacles in Milan. And it's a perfect place, I think, to start our investigations and our adventure. Now, after we visit the cathedral itself, we're going to visit the Duomo Museum and the Duomo rooftop. You know, during his stint as King of Italy, Napoleon offered to fund the Duomo's completion in 1805, in time for his coronation. So the architect piled on the neo-Gothic details, an homage to the original design that displayed a prescient use of fashion, logic. I mean, example, everything old, it's all new again. The petrified pinnacles, cusps, buttresses, arches, and more than 3,000 statues are almost all products of the 19th century. Now we're gonna to travel to the roof terrace where we will be within touching distance of the elaborate 135 spires and their forest of flying buttresses. Now in the center rises the 15th century spire on top of which is the golden Madonina erected in 1774. She was the highest point in the city until the Pirelli skyscraper outdid her in 1958. Now across the piazza is the entrance to the Galleria Vittorio Emmanuel II. It is so much more than a shopping arcade. This neoclassical Galleria Vittorio Emmanuel II is a soaring structure of iron and glass, nicknamed Il Salotto di Milano, the city's drawing room. It's been at the center of city life since 1877. It's known for its high-end boutiques. The original Prada store is located here, 
and it's equally lofty dining. I'm really looking forward to walking to the La Scala Opera House and Museum. Milan's famous Teatro a La Scala opened in 1778 with an opera by Antonio Salieri, Mozart's wannabe rival. Today, opera buffs can get a glimpse of the theater and tour the adjacent museum's extensive collection, featuring Verdi's top hat, Rossini's eyeglasses, Toscanini's baton, Fettuccini's pesto, original scores, diorama stage sets, busts, portraits, and death masks of great composers and musicians. I'm sure for few, true devotees, La Scala is like the Mecca of the religion of opera. Now, we're not likely to tour the museum. As opera, it's not really our thing. But as the Mecca for opera lovers, we're going to want to drop by. Now, Milan's most famous painting, Leonardo da Vinci's The Last Supper, it's hidden away on a wall of the refractory adjoining the Basilica di, Sant, di Santa Maria del Grazi depicting Christ and his disciples at the dramatic moment when Christ reveals he is aware of the betrayal of foot. It is a masterful psychological study and one of the world's most iconic images. No pictures, no pictures are allowed inside. So my later episode of the actual visit, we're gonna to have to borrow from the official photos from inside. Now this is by far the most challenging ticket to get. They only open tickets about two or three months ahead of the time that the tickets will be used. Tickets for each calendar event go on sale about three months ahead. And so, for example, bookings in May, which is our time, is supposed to be opening in February. I'm recording this in early February. They're not available yet. So check the website to find out when tickets for your dates will be released. Check often because if you're going to go at peak season be ready to book the moment they're released and that's the moment they're released milan time at 9 a.m and that means where i live being on the computer at 2 a.m in the central time zone let's keep connecting the dots and let's talk about where are we going to lay our heads and sleep now rick steves has his suggested hotels all are within a few minutes walk of the metro stations. Now with Milan's fine subway system, we should be able to get anywhere in town in a flash. St. Rick also tends to avoid chain hotels and chain restaurants. He, he chooses to instead find smaller and family style hotels. And the good ones charge top dollar for their location. So if you are looking to save a few euros, there are some decent basic chain hotels, such as an Ibis, that are found near some metro stops. Now, the hotels near the Duomo area is thick with people watching. There are some reasonably priced eateries and the major sightseeing attractions. But the prices are high, and I've marked those hotels in green. Now, between the Opera House and the Sephora Castle, there's a number of slightly less central places that are close to many shopping, good shopping and good restaurants. So I've marked those hotels in blue. Now the hotels near the Last Supper are farther from the action. They're kind of in a sleepy, mostly residential zone, but the prices are lower. And it's about a 15 minute walk to get from those hotels back to the main Duomo Piazza. And I've marked those hotels in orange. A few more hotels are about a 10 minute walk east of the Basilica. I've marked them in purple. And finally, the train station neighborhood is more practical than characteristic or charismatic for that matter. Its hotels are very utilitarian. They're business class places with prices that bounce all over depending on what kind of convention schedule there is in town. You might also find there's a few more shady characters than shady trees in the park, along with a lot of ethnic restaurants and massage parlors as you head away from the station. But it's convenient to trains, the metro, and the airport schedule. So 
So I've marked them in red. Might not be the best place for you to bring your family, but you will find some value there. Now we decided to give the Hotel Spadari a try. Our driver will bring us directly to the hotel, so we're gonna skip any transfers at the train station. Now the hotel supposedly boasts kind of an Art Deco inspired lobby that was designed by the Milanese artist Gio Pomodoro, or I guess it's translated Joe Tomato in English. It's about 40 rooms, all are color coded in this cool blue, it's kind of a blue hotel. Each room, I guess, has billowing drapes and big paintings uh, and designer doors. That's about two blocks from the Duomo. It should be an interesting first few nights in Milan. Uh, we secured those rooms for about 370 euros per night. Now Milan's hundreds of trendy bars and delis and rotisserie and self-serve cafeterias cater to people with plenty of taste and more money than time. We should be able to find delightful eateries all over town. Now Milan's signature dishes are risotto a la Milanese and osso buco. The risotto is often flavored with saffron, which gives it an intensely yellow color. Uh, the subtle flavors of saffron pairs nicely with the veal shanks of osso buco, which means marrow or literally hole in the bone shank. Uh, the prized marrow, extracted with special little forks, is considered the best part of the meal. Now, also popular is the cotoletta a la Milanese, a thin breaded veal cutlet fried in clarified butter. Now, some places have supersized it and call it or chuchio, I'm going to say this up, or ora chichio di elefante, or elefante elephant ear. So it's often large enough to share. Now locals often like to precede their meals with an aperitif, an aperitivio, a buffet of finger foods offered free with a drink during happy hours. So while Campari made its debut in Milan, a simple glass of vino bianco or prosecco, an Italian champagne, is just as popular. At about six o'clock, most bars, well, some bars, will fill up their counters with inviting little baskets of munchies served free with those drinks. So maybe that cheap drink, it's not going to feel cheap, can become a light meal. Locals are said to joke that you can make your apertivio an uh, uh, persiena. Cena means dinner for the cost of a cocktail. The Apertivio custom is common throughout Italy, but it's especially prized by the Milanese. They invented it. Now our first night we're going to probably eat light, uh, since we'll be struggling with our first day in a new time zone. Now for our final night though, or our second night, we've made reservations at Anoteca Bocca Don Divinio. It's reputed to be a fun-loving place. It doesn't have a menu. You enjoy six courses for around 70 euros each. Each one of the courses has a different bottle of wine that's designed to match. A constant parade of food carts roll through this happy dining room, keeping everyone entertained and happily fed. Now, one of the owners is Fabrizio. I guess he's a master of ceremonies. He makes sure that those of us that don't speak Italian, us English speakers, understand everything that's being served. Lots of quality meats and cheeses, pate, pasta, and a token vegetable course that is all designed to maximize your cholesterol. We might share a bigger table. It will be ours for the evening. And the restaurant's name is actually also a play on words, a divine mouthful or a mouthful of wine. Now for world-class window shopping, we're going to visit the Quadrilateral. It's an elegant high fashion shopping area around Via Montenapolone, just northeast of La Scala Opera House. This was the original Beverly Hills of Milan. In the 1920s, the top fashion shops moved in, and today it remains the place for designer labels. 
Now, in this land where fur is still prized, the people watching is said to be as entertaining as the window shopping. Well, you can see for our first stops, we are squeezing a lot in to our Milan uh, visit. Again, it has this dual purpose. It's our first stop, so we want to acclimate a little bit to the area, so a real quiet day, and then some highlights, really, with the highlight, I think, of being the Last Supper, um, which, again, make sure you put your focus on getting those tickets in an efficient way. Uh, they are the hardest ticket to get uh, in Milan, for sure. So what's up next? Next up is Lake Como. We're going to be heading to Varenna for a few days of relaxation and some fun. Well, that wraps up our first stop on our Italian adventure, Milan. Now, I hope you have enjoyed this and have found it informative. If you're like me and planning the trip is almost as much fun as going on it, then be sure to tune in for all of our episodes. And so next time, when we travel to Lake Como for a few days of strolling and relaxing, be well and take care.